Good morning, I'm Father Ryan Humphreys and welcome to COVID Catechism. This is part two of our Bible study on the book of Revelation. You remember last time we went into a somewhat exhaustive detail about what it is that we want to do when we read the Bible, what it is we want to accomplish when we study the Bible. And so we talked about all the senses of scripture and patristic interpretation. And, and we talked for a long time about those kind of di different aspects of what it means to study the Bible. Part two, we're going to really dig into the book of Revelation. And part two, part three, and part four are going to cover broadly the three major themes of the book of Revelation. This part is all about the angels and the messages of the angels to the seven cities. And this is the chapters two and three of the, of the book of Revelation. We're really going to get into what message is the Lord trying to send, what is you know, the common themes, and then what are the distinctions in those cities. While that can seem fairly unimportant, it actually really does set the entire stage for part three of our series, which will be going into the end of the world, the last times. What does the book of Revelation tell us about the apocalypse and the last days? And then the fourth part goes into the whole question of what heaven looks like and why heaven has so much imagery from the temple, why heaven has so much influence, or why the heaven, as it's shown in the book of Revelation, has so much influence upon the mass that we celebrate Sunday after Sunday. Sunday. And so we're today going to get started by digging into the whole question of the angels and the messages of the seven angels to the seven cities in chapters two and three of the book of Revelation. Now I have to say, this is a little dense and I'm going to have to read a little bit more of my presentation uh, than I have at other times. So if I, you do see the top of my head in my bald spot while I'm looking down to read, uh, please, uh, you know, just kind of bear with me because uh, some of this stuff is very, very hard to, uh, to get right. And I would rather uh, be precise than I would look like I'm doing all this off the top of my head. Let's start by noting how great a fool you have to be if you are convinced, as so many scholars today are, that angels aren't real. You've got to be just a dummy to believe that angels aren't real. Modern education, you know, as a, as a professor of mine once said, is all about educating people into imbecility. The angels are constant figures in the Old and the New Testament. And there are also a constant figures in the history of the church. We have angels in the Old Testament when Abram uh, is sent up to, to uh, stab his son Isaac. We have the angels of vengeance at Sodom and Gomorrah. We have the angel who smote the firstborn of Egypt. We have Raphael, the archangel, in the book of Tobit. We have the angel who assisted Elijah in the desert. We've got all sorts of angels in the Old Testament. Crossing into the New Testament, we have the unnamed angels who minister to Jesus in the desert and in the Garden of Gethsemane. We have the most famous of our angels, Gabriel, the archangel, who announces the birth of the Savior. We have the angels who, who, who spirit the apostles around in Acts of the Apostles. We have the angel who beats St. Paul. And of course, we have the multitude of angels that we see in the book of Revelation. And even, too, moving forward into history, we have all sorts of saints like Rose of Lima, Charles Barameo, who both saw and experienced angels in the course of their lives. And, of course, we can't forget, too, at Fatima in 1916, when the angel of peace appeared and told the children that they would see Our Lady of Fatima uh, come in, her, in glory uh, just not long after that. And so, you know, we have this, this strong sense of angels being a very, very real and not a figurative part of Scripture and our church history. Now, traditionally, Catholics find nine choirs of angels, and we call them choirs based upon the way that the Scripture reveals to us this categorization. It's important to know that angels are all as different from one another as a paperclip is from a question mark is from a piece of asparagus. They're utterly distinct, every angel created for its own purpose and its own good by the loving God. But they're divided based upon what they do and how they go about doing it. Uh, like I said, traditionally there are nine choirs separated from one another by their nearness to God. The first three of the choirs, counting bottom to top, are those that are nearest to us 
and therefore farthest from the divine throne. They are the angels, angelos, which we just call the angels, the archangels, and the principalities. And these choirs are predominantly concerned with us. It's from these choirs that the bulk of the guardian angels come. Uh, and these are the angels who are the protector angels of the human race and the world around us. The next three angels are, the next three categories, choirs of angels, are the powers, the virtues, and the dominions. Now, we should say these seem like odd names. And they are odd names because when you translate these names into English, they become kind of boring, you know. <laughs> it's just, it sounds much better in Latin. But, but they are the, these middle choirs are the, uh, the powers, the virtues, and the dominions. Uh, and these angels are predominantly involved in that kind of middle ground between us and God. They protect the cosmos. They do battle with the fallen angels. These are the ones who are responsible not directly for us nor directly for worshiping God, but for everything else in between. And then we have at the top of the list, the three highest choirs of angels, the thrones, the cherubim, and the seraphim. And these choirs are entirely concerned with worshiping and glorifying God and performing the works that need to be done to make heaven be what heaven is. And of course, the church has always believed, and we see it in the book of Revelation, Remember, the book of Revelation was written down about the year 100, maybe 98, somewhere in that range. But the church has always believed that every human being and every altar that has a proper relic in it is protected and defended by a particular dedicated guardian angel. And so we, you know, have this kind of very, very strong sense that the angels are an ordinary part of who we are. And we believed this early on. It's not like this was an innovation when St. Thomas Aquinas asked how many angels could dance on the head of a pen. This is something we believed from the beginning. And so we can turn our attention now, understanding just a little bit about angels, to the messages that the Lord gives to the angels of the seven churches under the authority of St. John. And these are, you know, remember when St. John is writing the book of Revelation, he is a bishop. He is the only one of the apostles who is still alive. All the rest were martyred. He is kind of the place where the, the faithful turn and say this right here. John is the last direct connection we have to Jesus. He's kind of the preeminent, preeminent bishop, even though the bishop of Rome is the Pope. Even though the Bishop of Rome is technically has authority over St. John, he has kind of this kind of moral sense around him. And these seven churches, which are under his specific authority, they get messages in his revelation. And so these are found in the second and third chapters of Revelation. And so let's just start and work our way through and we'll grab what is, what is the Lord saying to these churches? And then two, what message does that have for us? So we're going to start with Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his hand, he walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear evil men, but have tested those who call themselves apostles but are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember that, when, remember that from what you have fallen, Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Okay, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. This is the message to the church in Ephesus. First, lampstands. What does that mean? In the temple, Jewish temple, as in the church, a lit lamp indicates presence. It indicates the Lord is physically present here in the church. Now, you can't see our lampstand here, but if I were to walk back here and lift it, this is the sanctuary lamp. 
it's also very heavy. This is the sanctuary lamp, and it stays lit as long as our Lord is present in the tabernacle. And in the Jewish temple, the menorah of seven lights was lit there in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies. So the lampstand represents presence. Uh, and so that when the Lord says he's going to take away the lampstand, he is saying, I'm going to take away presence. I'm going to take away my presence from you. I'm going to abandon you. Uh, so God is with you, but he will take away that presence unless you live rightly. Now the Lord says they've started off pretty well, but he says that, that he, and we should notice that he has tested them a little bit, but then he says you should test, you should test those who call themselves apostles. They have not merely accepted the teaching, but they've tested it. And this is good for us. I mean, we live in a world where we are overcome by a plethora of religious teachers claiming to speak in the voice of the Holy Spirit. You know, my example is one of the people I can't stand above all in the Christian world, Joel Olstein. You know, Joel Olstein's a good example. He's not even remotely Christian. What he proposes is not remotely Christianity. And yet it has become so utterly common for people to say, I love to read Joel Olstein in the morning, or I love to listen to his sermons. And, you, and, you know, and in my mind, I go, well, this guy is not preaching Christianity. He's preaching a self-help gospel you know, that makes us feel good, but that has nothing to do with take up your cross and follow after me. It has nothing to do with you know, offer your suffering that you may enter into eternal life with the Lord. And of course, we have that too by any number of other religious faiths or religious people who are arguing, you know, you, you, you take your example, your typical Pentecostal pastor, as long as you're wearing the right clothes and you're baptized by full immersion and you pray in the name of Jesus, you're good. But if you can't pray in tongues, you can't go to heaven. I mean, that's just, it's just not sane. And we have the same thing with Catholics, though. We have some bishops who are saying it's perfectly fine uh, if, you know, to be homosexual and to live in a homosexual lifestyle. Or you have priests who say, no, no, I understand for you and your wife it's okay to use contraception. And this is the Lord, you know, and it's the church in Ephesus saying, don't it, test the apostles. And if they don't stand by the truth, cast them out. And that kind of vigilance can become an end in of itself, which is a problem. And so the Lord then adds back to them and says, the Lord, the love you had at first, we all, you know, the love you had at first, this is something that you can't lose touch with. And so the Lord is proposing a balance. You have to test the apostles. You have to make sure they're teaching the truth. But at the same time, you have to remember the genuine voice of the Holy Spirit. And there is a difficulty here. It's not easy, and we don't want to propose that it is easy. But then again, the Lord is not saying it should be easy. He's telling the church, you've got to make sure you do this right. Um, we should also remember, when we think about this idea of that love you had at first, thinking about within our own hearts and minds what is sometimes called in the spiritual life's first fervor, where you know, we have this kind of sense of when we first come to know the Lord, we're passionate. And then it becomes easier to be a little less and a little less and a little less and you sneak off and you kind of lose touch with what the Lord, re with not, not just the sense of what we're supposed to do for the Lord, but with who we're supposed to love. Now finally, we have this group that is cited by the, by the angel, uh, the Nicolaitans, which is a fairly difficult word to pronounce. These people are the religious fakers of their day. They claim to be devoted, they make a big show of it, uh, especially for the crowds to see, but they don't really believe. They just like the practice of religion. They like the show of religion. They like all of the pomp and circumstance, but they don't believe. And they're going to be brought up several times because they were a well-known example of these kind of religious fakers. Now, is overt and public devotion bad? Not at all. That's not what we're worried about here. The idea is it has to come and it has to flow from an authentic zeal for the Lord. If we just get into the habit of putting on all of my, you know, lacy kind of stuff and saying, okay, let's just go do this stuff, we'll jump through some hoops, and then I'll be done. That's not good. That's an incredibly unhealthy way to be, and we don't gain a whole lot of closeness to God in it. And so we have this kind of the, the, this buzzword of the Nicolaitans to kind of catch us and say, look, these people are the ones who have a big overt practice, but they don't believe what's on the inside. 
So that's the angel of the, speaking to the church in Ephesus. And those themes are going to be the same themes that we look at really in all of them, although to different degrees. You have the idea of, you know, test. You have the idea of, but be sincere. And you have the idea of don't get into the folks who have the big show without believing, without that show being authentic. Continuing with the, the scripture itself, verses 8 through 11 of chapter 2. Now we're going to speak to the church at Smyrna. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jesus and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who conquers shall not be hurt by the second death. Okay, a little bit of history to give you some sense. Smyrna was an, oh my God, rich city. It's like uh, Dubai. You know, I mean, everybody there is loaded. It's also one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It was a place with, you know, just gorgeous physical terrain and beautiful architecture. And so the people there were very prideful and very kind of pompous about their city. The Christians who taught that the eternal city made the present city a distant second. We're looking for the new Jerusalem, not the present Smyrna. Those people were looked upon kind of like terrible human beings. Like, we don't want you here. We're in the greatest city in the whole wide world, and you people are jerks. Uh, the rich um, will always struggle with Christianity. And of course, the Lord says that because it's just easy to take a little bit too much security from my money. You know, if this Christianity thing doesn't work out, at least I've got plenty of cash. I can do other things to keep myself entertained. And so it's difficult to preach the gospel among very, very wealthy people. It's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Um, but it's because of this that the Lord tells the Christians who are persecuted by the people of their city and by the Jews, he says to them, but you are the rich ones. You're the ones who are actually wealthy. The thing I like about this is the Lord is speaking a language that these Smyrnites actually can understand. They understand most of their life in terms of wealth and poverty. And so the Lord is saying, look, real riches, real beauty, real this, real that, that's good stuff. That's what matters. And so he's not expecting them to understand something in a context of the poverty of Jerusalem. He's talking to them in a way they can understand. We also get here the first mention of the synagogue of Satan. This is one of those phrases that doesn't happen very often, uh, but it shows up a couple times in Revelation, and boy, is it serious. Uh, it's the kind of thing that would make a very strong statement to the Jews in the city of Smyrna. This is the place where the devil has taken over and led people who should be good astray. This is where those ap lying apostles, fake apostles, that's where they do their work. It's where they spread their evil. It's also going to be a point where we're going to start to understand that the, the smoke of Satan has power against the church. And even though Jesus told Peter, the gates of hell will not rise against you and against the church, that it is possible for there to be people within the church who are liars and deceivers and falsifiers. And of course, this is something that's going to be important to John, who has lived now his life as a bishop and looks around and sees deceivers and people claiming to preach Christianity that is in fact false Christianity. We're going to continue to see some of these same themes develop as we move to the message to the church in Pergamum. Uh, so this is chapters or verses 12 through 17 of Revelation 2. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. If you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, 
my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, and have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice immorality. So you also have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone, which no one knows except him who receives it. To begin with, we know that the sharp two-edged sword is, of course, the Scripture. That's the word of truth. The one who has the Scripture is our Lord Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, and the church legitimately given that authority to preach. Again, here we have the mention of Satan. Here, though, that throne that we're talking about is actually in the city of Pergamum, the temple of Zeus, which was a major feature right at the heart of the city, big giant temple of Zeus. This was something that the Pergamites all knew. And so the temple played host to many festivals and banquets that could only be gotten into if you had the right coded invitation. And so a white stone with some special marking on it the Lord is basically saying, listen, you get into those bacchanalia, as they were called, these, these basically orgies of, of eating and drinking and, and immorality, you get into those with this special white stone. If you found yourself in that, you've got to get out of that way of thinking, and the Lord will give you something new. It's also worth noting all the military imagery, the swords and this and the other, and God will do war against you. And that's an incredibly potent image for, again, the people of Pergamum. And the Lord here is speaking a language and using imagery and metaphor that they would understand. Had Jesus shown up here and now, one expects that the Lord would not be talking about shepherds and be talking about fishing. He would be talking about social media, and he might be talking about nuclear weapons, and he might not talk about how the, spirit, the, the word is a sharp two-edged sword. He might be talking about how the word is a bullet that passes through all things until it does what it must do. You know, we have this idea that the Lord wants to speak to us using images and metaphors that we can understand. And so each of these cities is getting images and metaphors that speaks very powerfully to that city and the people of it. And that's actually a blessing because it means that the Lord can speak to us in images and metaphors that we can understand as well. Again, we get the religious imposters, the Nicolaitans. They appear as a reminder uh, that what other, whatever other religions are out there, and in, in Pergamum, Zeus worship was ginormous, that no matter what else is out there, Christianity is the one and only true religion of the one and only true God. So you can't be a Christian and go to the Bacchanalia of Zeus. You can't be a Christian and go to the temple of Zeus. That doesn't work. There is one God, one Lord, one baptism, one church, one worship. And so, you know, the Lord is very, very strongly pushing that forward and says that anybody who poses that ultimately is at war with the truth. Moving forward now to city number four, this is uh, th- uh, thi- oh goodness, <laughs> Thyatish- th- 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 Thyateria, goodness gracious. I've got some, uh, some notes on my thing and I've accidentally spread through one of the cities. Um, so this is verses 18 through 28. And so we have uh, now the fourth city and the angel of the church, uh, the angel of the Lord to the church in Thyateria, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Again, this is going to attach to images common in the city. I know your works, your love, and your faith and servant and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her immorality. 
Behold, I will throw her on a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her doings. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches mind and heart. I will give to each of you as your works deserve, but to the rest of you in Thyatisha, who do not hold this teaching and have not learned what some, what some call the deep things of Satan. Deep things of Satan. To you, I say, I do not lay upon you any other burden. Only hold fast to what you have here until I come. He who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, I will give him power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received power from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so the town of Theateria is a little town, uh, compared to the great cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum. The message, though, is not very different. In this case, the Lord knows that most of them have done really well. They've tried really hard to get it right, but the, some of them have been lured away by a false teacher. In this case, it's unclear whether that false teacher is an individual person named this thing, uh, named um, uh, Jezebel, or whether it is kind of a sect or like a little cult uh, that is associated with what has come to be known as the Jezebel spirit. Uh, this depends upon your reading of the Greek. It's not something that's necessary for us to dig into too deeply here. Um, the Jezebel in the Old Testament, remember, is the wife of Ahab. And she convinces the king to destroy the altar in the temple and to put up uh, rather a, a pagan style, a pagan sign uh, for the god Baal. And we have that incredible image where Elijah the prophet does battle with all the prophets of Baal. And then there is, you know, the whole idea of the building of the temple and or rather you build the... Uh, you build the huge altars and you put the wood on it and, and Elijah says, you know, dunk the wood three times, so on and so forth. Read, read one and two kings for this. They're wonderful. But you have that whole image of Elijah defeating the prophets of Baal and Jezebel trying to kill him. And that's when Elijah goes into the desert. Then he goes to the cave. Then he finds the voice of the Lord in a still small spirit, so on and so forth. So Elijah the prophet, or rather uh, Jezebel then, comes to symbolize and be an image of pagan idol worship, rejecting the truth, knowing the truth, rejecting it, and embracing falsity, which is very different than saying, I grew up in a pagan household and I follow what my parents do. When you know the truth and you reject it, that's a greater evil than never having known the truth at all. And so we have the idea that this woman Jezebel or her sect knew the truth and somehow rejected it and led people astray. And we certainly see that in our modern world where, you know, basically everybody who comes up to me, I say, oh, I'm Father Ryan Humphreys. And they go, oh, I used to be Catholic. And I go, <laughs> not going to bode well for you on Judgment Day. Uh, finally, in this, this message to the church in uh, Thyatira, good enough, why can't I say that word today? Uh, finally, the Lord wants to encourage those who have, who have remained pure and have not gotten too close to the deep things of Satan. That's important. We need to be encouraged if we have not fallen for that which would be easier. You know, I mean, we have to think about how many Catholics nowadays, for example, have fallen into the sin of contraception. It's become almost ubiquitous. You know, the, the estimates are in the neighborhood of 90% of Catholic couples who are married using contraception. And you say, we really need to have a pat on the back and an encouragement for those who have said, you know what? It's easier, but it's not right. It's not true and it's not good. And so I'm not going to give in to that temptation. There does need to be a genuine sense of encouragement and it helps that the Lord really does care. That it helps that the Lord really does want to encourage us to stay the course even though it's so much easier. Even though Father so-and-so or Bishop such-and-such -such says, oh, that part of the faith is too hard, do whatever you want. That priest or that bishop is likely to spend eternity burning in the fires of hell. We don't want to join them. We need to hold fast to the truth. And so the Lord says, look, encourage people who are holding fast to the truth. It is easy to fall into the deep things of Satan. Don't do it. 
fight for what is right. Do what you can do. If you've been tricked, if you've been deceived, repent. We had that in three of the four cities we've heard to. If you repent, I will forgive you. Okay, let's look at city number five, the city of Sardis. This is in the beginning of Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to have the first six verses of chapter 3. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. That's a new. I know your works, and you have the name of being alive, and you are dead. Awake and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death. For I have not found your works perfect in the sight of God. Remember that what you received and heard, keep that and repent. If you will not awake, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. Yet you have a still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, a few names. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who conquers shall be clad thus in white garments, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. <laughs> yeah, take just a moment to be with that. Now, Sardis is the Las Vegas of the ancient world. It's a place of great sin, a place of vice. This is where people go to do evil, and they're excited about it. This is where you go to watch people murder each other in the street. This is where you go to gamble and whore and do all the kinds of things that you would expect and you would associate with the worst vices of the ancient world. So unlike the complimentary messages that the first four angels had, you know, you're doing okay, but you've got to fight against this. Or you know what, you're doing great, but, but avoid this thing or that thing. This message is basically, you people are all a disaster. And you've got to get your heads out of where they're stuck and start moving forward. Because right now, there are only a handful of you who are going to heaven and the rest of you are going to burn. It's a tough tough message. If you ever want to be really, you know, convinced and, and reminded of how necessary it is to live the faith right, just flip to Revelation chapter 3 and read a couple verses. Uh, so unlike the complimentary messages before, these are tough messages. Now, of course, the Lord offers them like he offers all of us, repentance. And he says, listen, if you want to wake up and repent, I will forgive you. Because I am faithful to myself, all you need to do is repent. And that's an incredibly important message for us. Some of us may find ourselves in a habit of big sins or little sins. I mean, you might find yourself in the midst of an addiction that's destroying your life, or you might find yourself simply addicted to talking to your sister-in-law because, goodness gracious, she has the best gossip in town. No matter what, where we stand, anything we are, that, that we find ourselves truly in a kind of state of ongoing sin this message to the church in Sardis is potent to us. Awake, reject that, do whatever it takes, but wake up and repent of your sins in order that you might be saved. And so now we're going to get to church number six, and this is Philadelphia, the church at Philadelphia. Uh, so this is chapter three, verses seven through 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shall shut, who shuts and no one shall open. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of you in the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jesus and are not, but lie, Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and learn that I have loved you because you have kept my word of patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial which is coming in the whole world to try those who dwell upon the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. He who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
All right, now Philadelphia is interesting for a number of reasons. First, it's already had its name changed one time. Uh, in 17 BC, it was destroyed by an earthquake, and so it was renamed from Philadelphia to Neo Caesarea. Here, the angel promises another new name. Um, the theme of this particular message really is about, on the one hand, conversion, and the idea of, of loving our brothers, Philadelphia, that's what the city it means, city of brotherly love. But it's also, we have this image once again of the synagogue of Satan. And it's fairly clear that we have a faithful church that is preaching the truth of Jesus Christ. And then we have liars. We have a church that is clearly kind of created as, a, it's, it's created itself as the one true church. It's false. It's teaching falsity. It's driving people away from the truth. And those people will not do well on the last day. This is an important thing for, for us to keep in mind, uh, both myself as a priest, also all of us who are listening as laity, how important it is to hold fast to the genuine truth of the church and not to get into our heads the idea that I can set up an alternate church. You know, we see this a lot nowadays where people are like, well, I've got the truth of the Christian faith. No, no, I have the truth of the Christian faith. No, no, I am the real story of this. And we see this a lot, you know, on, on Twitter. We see it a lot in the real world. We see it a lot all over the place where we live in a world where the Catholic Church has the true faith. But we have priests and bishops who are teaching falsity. We have lots of Protestants who are not teaching the fullness of the faith. We have all sorts of people around us who are claiming to speak for the truth of Jesus Christ, but remarkably few who are in genuine humility of heart and in genuine love for neighbor embracing the authentic truth of Jesus Christ. And this is a, it's a potent message because while the Lord is very complimentary of the church in Philadelphia, he has no time whatsoever for this synagogue of Satan. And he basically says, these people are not going to do well on the last day. You can start to see that this theme is becoming very common because in this part of the world, St. John has now lived long enough for there to be several churches that have been established, in some cases more than one church in any given city, and now we start to have people who are starting to look for power, who want the authority of the church, who want to be themselves authority figures in the church, and they're willing to sacrifice the genuine discipleship for it. And so this becomes one of the constant messages now of the book of Revelation, saying when the final battle comes, faithfulness obedience to the genuine truth and the capacity to look past the lies of others to the true Jesus, that's what's going to matter. We start to get really hit home the idea that there is an antichrist, he is real, and it's not just one individual, but there's all sorts of people who are standing for false versions of Christianity, and that unless we learn how to see through those false versions of Christianity, we will not be saved. Now, Again, we don't need to get ourselves too caught up about the end of the world. That's the next talk. But this is one of these themes that's going to be prevalent throughout the entire book of Revelation. So let's now hit the last of these seven churches, and we're coming into the home stretch of our talk now. This is the chapter, or chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, and this is the last message. This is to the, the angel of the church of Laodicea. Or, uh, Laodicea. He says, To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, The words of the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Literally, I will vomit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing not knowing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may be rich and white garments to clothe you and keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen and salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and chasten. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. He who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, Laodicea is a wealthy resort town. Um, it had natural hot springs, which at a time uh, when, when basically a Roman bath involved a pile of slaves, uh, you know, and these complicated and extremely expensive uh, and resource-intense efforts to make warm water, uh, a natural hot spring was a big, big deal. Uh, and so in the ancient world, that means that Laodicea is a place where the very wealthy uh, and the very indulgent either have their main home or they have a secondary estate of some sort. And so the language about hot or cold uh, makes a lot more sense when we think about that because these are people who really are, you know, saying, look, I, I want the convenience of heat, you know, and, and the Lord is looking and saying, but, but you're not really hot. You know, you're not really ablaze a with any kind of passion. You're just kind of blah. And so if, it'd be so much better if you were either cold, uh, you know, and at least were not attached at all, or you were really aflame. But the fact that you're just kind of in this middle ground, sitting in your largeness in, in, in a hot tub somewhere, you know, that's ultimately uh, blah. And then, of course, we add to this the image of vomit. The idea of, of vomiting is something that was at the very, very worst of the kind of Roman bacchanalia, the very worst of the indulgence. The idea was you would go and you would eat, 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 and drink, 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 and then you would vomit and you would go and eat and drink some more. Now, you know, this isn't something that happened every day. It's been overrepresented in Roman history, but this is something the very wealthy did. And in places like Laodicea, this was something that was not uncommon, the idea of vomiting out. And so you have here this image of people who are clearly in the church. You know, this is the Lord speaking to people who are part of the church, but they're not really taking it seriously. They show up, maybe they give a few bucks, maybe they don't, but they're not taking it seriously. And so the idea is they think they're in the church, but the Lord is going to vomit them out. You're going to be cast out into the darkness. Uh, and, and the imagery of the idea of, you know, your false wealth, you, you, your false membership, your false partnership with us, all that stuff is going to go away when you are vomited out of the mouth for not living the faith. And the image is followed by two of these beautiful, eloquent images in Scripture. One is the refiner's fire, and then the other is the Lord knocking at the door. Two gorgeously beautiful stories about, you know, the, these are rather two gorgeous images of the Lord's love and mercy. The refiner's fire would have been something that these people would have understood because gold, very important in the ancient world, and these people would have had a lot of it. So they would have gone to the refiner. And what do you see? The refiner is a relatively poor person. He's there and he's got this extremely hot fire, almost certainly a handful of slaves feeding the fire. He puts the gold into this kind of cast iron situation uh, with probably kind of uh, volcanic rock associated with it. But anyway, he's going to boil this gold, very, very hot, and he's going to scrape off the top layer and impurity are going to continue to come to the top and he's going to pull some aluminum and some tin off and the refiner's fire goes over and over again and every time he scrapes you're losing a little gold but the more you scrape the less volume of gold you have the purer that gold is and so you have this kind of conundrum of you know if I've got what we would consider say 10 karat gold um, and I can sell this 10 karat gold for whatever number of coins. If I refine it, I would end up with what we might call 18 karat gold, but there's less of it. And so then it becomes this kind of back and forth about who I can trade with and how I can convince them of the value, the goodness, the quality of my gold. And the refiner's fire is such that Jesus is not going to take any of that. He's going to refine and refine and refine until it is perfectly pure, which means it is truly valuable. We also get the image of Jesus standing at the door and knocking. And that image, of course, reminds us that our free will is what matters. That it's not a function of me simply saying Jesus needs to take care of this or someone else can do it. The Lord is knocking at my heart and until I open the door, he is not going to do 
for me anything that I don't ask him to do. And again, these are people who are by their nature treated with servants. These are people who are wealthy. And so even the Christians among them are going to have servants to do this and servants to do that. And so the idea is if Jesus is knocking, a servant is not going to open the door. I am. I'm going to have to get off my bum and go across the room and get out of my hot tub and go open the door myself. And so it's an incredibly potent image and one that we have to keep in mind. Uh, and so so that's a lot to think on. I've been talking for 45 minutes. There's a lot here. And, you know, if you listen to this 10 times, you probably still wouldn't grasp all the little nuance. And that's okay because I'm not the expert on this and I didn't even talk about everything. So what I would recommend you do is look into, if you're really interested in this aspect of it, uh, Dr. Scott Hahn's book on the book of Revelation, uh, which I, I forget right now the, the title of. Uh, it may be called The Lamb's Supper is incredible. Uh, it's very, very good. He's got the best book on Revelation that I know of, and he goes into all the little details of these messages. But this sets for us the stage of what the entire book of Revelation is going to talk about. It's this idea of being able to see through the lies, recognizing the truth, engaging Jesus for the purpose of being saved, and not merely to assume that if I'm part of the church, I'm already saved. And to, to be very, very cautious because there are going to be falsities, there's going to be liars, there's going to be deceptions, and we need to make sure that we have the tools to see through those deceptions. Uh, and so, just by way of a basic recap, angels are important messengers. Uh, they are signs and symbols in and of themselves. And to the various churches, God is going to talk about how much he hates imposters and idolaters. We want to keep ourselves pure in religion and morality. That's essential. The Lord wants to save us and raise us up to positions of honor in heaven. He's serious about our, his love for us, regardless of the difficulties that we experience in life. What he has promised for us is so, so much greater. That's part two. Part three is going to take us into heaven. We're going to look at heaven, a little bit of hell, but mostly heaven. We want to get a sense of, um, actually, I'm lying to you. That's part uh, four is heaven. Part three is the end of the world. I, I, I got my, my head screwed, screwed on wrong. Part three is the end of the world. That's when we're going to look at all of these crazy images. Remember last time I talked about the hornet with blonde hair. We're going to get into those things. We're going to look at what the end means. What are the seven seals? What's the story with that? So the apocalypse comes next. Uh, I'm giving this this talk on Tuesday the 5th. You might not be watching it then, but Thursday the 7th will be the talk on Apocalypse, and then the following Tuesday, which I believe is the 12th, will be the talk on heaven and very, very little bit on hell, but mostly on heaven and what that means for us, especially as it regards the mass. And so thank you for joining for me, me for part two, and I hope uh, that you will see me again. I can't see you, but I hope you'll see me again for part three of our COVID catechism on the Bible study of the book of Revelation. Until then, God reward you.